Would Libya and its people be in a better or worse place today had the United Nations not authorized military intervention in 2011? What lessons does the Libya intervention hold for humanitarian intervention and doctrine of responsibility to protect? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute's interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Wain Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Ian Martin. Ian Martin has led United Nations field missions in several countries, including a special representative of the Secretary General and head of the UN support mission in Libya from 2011 to 2012. He also served in senior positions for the UN in East Timor, Ethiopia and Eritrea, Haiti, Nepal and Rwanda. Martin was from 1986 to 1992, Secretary General of Amnesty International, Vice President of the International Center for Transitional Justice from 2002 to 2005, and from 2015 to 2018, Executive Director of Security Council Report. His most recent book, which I very highly recommend, is All Necessary Measures, question mark, the United Nations and International Intervention in Libya, published by Hearst in April of this year. Ian Martin, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. My pleasure. My first question is, why Libya? Um, you've served in numerous crisis zones with the United Nations and are also the former Secretary General of Amnesty International. In other words, you've seen your share of human rights catastrophes. Um, was there something unique to Libya that explains this intervention? Was it a confluence of a particular set of regional and international circumstances, or perhaps a combination of the two? I think every intervention or indeed non-intervention is, is unique. Uh, unique in the national situation, unique in the regional context, and unique in the wider international context. Um, uh, that's one of the reasons why I get very irritated when I see Libya lumped in with Iraq and Afghanistan as if those three situations, whatever one's ultimate judgment is on each of the interventions, as if they were in some way similar when, when I think in many ways they're radically different. Um, I don't regard myself as a gung-ho interventionist or, or an anti-interventionist. Um, I worked in Rwanda, as you mentioned, and just after the genocide and saw the consequences of non-intervention. Um, I was in East Timor heading the mission that ran what was called the popular consultation, the self-determination referendum, and was there in the violence that followed and welcomed and indeed encouraged an Australian-led military intervention. It was in 99, I believe. 99, that's right, authorized by the United Nations. Um, and I was so opposed to the illegal invasion of Iraq that I resigned uh, 38 years membership of uh, the Labour Party uh, when Tony Blair followed George Bush in, in that. So, so I think these are very different contexts. Libya certainly was unique, um, uh, unique in the uh, dictatorship of, of Gaddafi and the, the, the hatred that engendered from many Libyans. Um, the regional context was extremely important, the context of the Arab uprisings, which generated all kinds of expectations as to uh, what might happen uh, in Libya once uh, Mubarak had uh, been forced out in Egypt and Ben Ali had been forced out in, in Tunisia. Um, unique in the regional context from the way Gaddafi had alienated um, uh, the uh, uh, many of the Arab, other Arab heads of state. Um, Even all of them. Well, pretty much all of them, yes. Um, in Africa, the uh, the balance was much more right. much more divided between uh, those who, who had some in some way favoured him and uh, those who opposed him. Um, so I'm afraid I, I I think one really has to look at each situation uh, in its particular context, and and certainly it's almost. Um, a misstatement to say somewhere is very unique because everywhere is unique. But I think uh, uh, Libya was a very particular situation and the regional context was a very particular one. Mm -hmm. um, on, on that point, um, in your book, All Necessary Measures, you refer to the ghosts of uh, Rwanda and Srebrenica in uh, Bosnia as important factors in understanding the Libya intervention. 
Another issue you reference, um, which you did again um, uh, just now, is um, the upheaval in, uh, in the Arab world during uh, the same period and the desire of some to be seen on, on the right side of uh, history. And maybe it's particularly noteworthy that um, the French president, uh, Sarkozy, came under a lot of criticism for coddling uh, Ben Ali at the beginning of, uh, of the Tunisian uprising. Um, so my question is, would it be fair to conclude that the Libya intervention was to a significant extent, not necessarily about Libya, but rather an attempt by those who intervened to settle accounts that they had incurred elsewhere? I think that would be going too far to talk about settling accounts from from elsewhere. Uh, both those factors, the, uh, the 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 background, uh, what had happened in Bosnia and Rwanda, and the way that had shamed uh, many in the international community, was one can see it, in, and I traced that in the responses of uh, certainly Western uh, policymakers. Although one also had. Paul Kagame of Rwanda weighing in in support of uh, intervention uh, out of his own country's uh, experience. Um, so that was clearly uh, a factor. Um, but I still think that it wasn't the um, either the, 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 the context of Rwanda and Bosnia or indeed the wider context, the Arab Spring, that dictated what happened in Libya. I think it shaped the responses to it. Um, but, uh, you know, Libya was the consequence of the uprising in Libya. Um, and although that too may have drawn somewhat some inspiration from what was happened in Egypt and, and Tunisia, uh, I think essentially that came out of um, uh, the long period of, uh, of dictatorship in Libya. And I'd, I'd now like to ask you to elaborate on um, quote unquote uh, mission creep. Um, in your book, you explain how the intervention went from one of, um, in your words, preventing harm to, or rather you quoting others' words um, who were deeply involved in the intervention. It went from one of preventing harm to civilians, not providing arms to the opposition, to one where regime change and the elimination of Muammar al-Qaddafi, whether personally or at least from power, became explicit objectives. At the same time, as you know, the United Nations Security Council, which had authorized the military intervention by virtue of Resolution 1973 of 11 March 2011, was powerless to hold those who strayed increasingly beyond its terms to account for their actions. Um, do you consider these developments to have been inevitable once the intervention got underway? Not completely inevitable. I think there were other options. Um, uh, I think there was certainly an option on the part of uh, those who intervened to pause after Benghazi, the Gaddafi's onslaught on Gaddafi, on, on uh, Benghazi had been prevented. Um, there were those who thought there should then have been a pause and an effort to seek a, a mediated outcome. Um, we shall never know whether a mediated outcome could have been achieved, um, but certainly uh, I think much more could have been done in a coordinated way to seek a managed transition uh, if people on both sides of that question had, uh, had sought it. Um, so I don't think it was all inevitable, and I don't think, well, Gaddafi's conduct may have been inevitable in terms of his personality, but uh, uh, he too could have chosen to genuinely have a ceasefire, which he said on a number of occasions they were having but but didn't, uh, offer some olive branch, tone down the rhetoric that remained consistently threatening. So uh, so I don't think everything was, was inevitable, um, uh, but uh, uh, certainly um, there were strong factors that push towards only a, a, a military outcome. And, and what, what were those uh, factors, or at least what were the primary ones? Well, I think, uh, you know, clearly the National Transitional Council and those supporting it most strongly, which, which meant the UK and France more than the, the US, really. Sorry, then the National Transitional Council being the, the umbrella body that represented uh, Libya. The, the leadership of the, of the rebels established in, in Benghazi and yes. uh, that was then very active in external lobbying for, for support. Mm -hmm. 
um, uh, very at, at the very beginning, there were people there who um, I think would have uh, sought perhaps some managed transition and indeed had come out of uh, working inside uh, Gaddafi's system. Sometimes um, very closely. Indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. But as time went on and as more blood was shed, then attitudes uh, harden. Um, uh, and uh, Gaddafi too, I mean, there was huge disappointment when Saif al-Islam Gaddafi made his first speech and instead of uh, putting himself forward in what some people thought he was the potential reformer of the, the regime, um, really threw his lot in completely with his father and the rest of the family in terms of uh, uh, their military action. And, and um, you describe this as almost kind of an act of, of family solidarity against a, a menacing external environment and that Gaddafi would, would brook no compromise from any of his uh, closest relatives. In his yes, family. there are others who have written up close with, with information that I only have it, uh, there uh, uh, from them uh, about discussions within the family and how Gaddafi himself and, and brothers insisted that, uh, that Saif align himself. Um, and you know, obviously there's a history of some tensions within the family before we get to the, uh, mm. uh, the, the, the uprising. Um, so uh, yes, I don't think I don't think it was always inevitable. But one of the most difficult questions about mission creep is when does protection of civilians become regime change? Um, it's very hard to draw a clear line because what became the case of the the interveners was that. Uh, as long as Gaddafi was still in power and um, still had the military means to do so, he posed a threat to civilians and therefore uh, their role was not merely to protect uh, particular towns and cities under attack, but to degrade his forces, as they said. Um, I think that red line is hard to draw, but I've no doubt in my own mind that a red line was crossed and that uh, eventually the military intervention became uh, NATO providing aerial support to rebel advances, uh, not merely to protection of places that were threatened by Gaddafi's uh, forces. Uh, and of course, there's the whole story of the, the ground war, which I knew very little about uh, uh, at the time uh, and the very considerable secret special forces operation mounted by the UK, France, uh, Qatar, and the, and the UAE. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry, oh, I, th I thought you had frozen, my apologies. So, no, um, I'm frozen. Okay. <laughs> I've paused. <laughs> um, so, uh, in, in, uh, sorry, continuing from those countries you just mentioned, um, the Libya intervention was the initiative of two allied, but also often quite fractious coalitions, a Western one led by the United States, the United Kingdom and France, and an Arab one led primarily by Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. Would it be correct to conclude that in Libya, it was the Europeans rather than the Americans who were most keen to act, and that these, that the European powers would have ultimately found it very difficult to do so without the equally enthusiastic appetite for intervention and subsequently regime change um, by the regional parties. Yes, I think both those things are, are true. I mean, it's very clear from the, the record, particularly of decision-making within the Obama administration that Obama was not uh, gung-ho the way that uh, I think Sarkozy and Cameron can be described as, as gung-ho. Um, I, I quote uh, Gates, who's uh, Secretary of Defense, who, who of course was uh, opposed to, to the military intervention, uh, as saying that Obama told him after he'd taken the decision that it was a 51-49 call. Um, and then we see uh, Obama making very clear that the only basis on which he's gone along is one in which the, the lead would be taken, um, in his view, even the post-conflict lead by, by the Europeans. Mm -hmm. And it's also true that, that both the Europeans and uh, Obama were very keen to have uh, regional support. Um, um, but what's not true, I mean, sometimes a story is told as if, as if the Westerners sort of 
sought cover from uh, and, and put pressure on the Arabs to give them that cover. I actually think that uh, Qatar in, in particular and, and, and others were were lobbying Washington for the intervention. So um, well, Qatar, Qatar was at the height of its powers and, and as detailed yes. in your book was lobbying very energetically yes. um, within yes. the Arab League and, and also in the West for this to happen. And it's also worth, uh, you know, considering again the climate in much of the Arab world, because uh, um, there's a very strong NGO statement from a, an impressive list of uh, Arab civil society organisations, sort of demanding demanding intervention. So, um, uh, so yes, it, it was it was both the uh, the regional pressure and the European uh, pressure, and they, they both in the end weighed considerably with, uh, with Obama, I think. G given that you um, ascribe genuine initiative um, in one form or another to, to all these parties, how did the interplay between these international, regional, and increasingly also Libyan parties serve ultimately to foil uh, the transition and, and in the situation in which we saw Libya descend into uh, a state of civil war for many years? I mean, any kind of effective coordination didn't survive the, uh, the, the, the military victory. Mm -hmm. So far as Qatar and the UAE are concerned, one can see the tensions emerging. Um, I mean, they weren't there at the very beginning of the Arab League decision making, I don't think, but they were certainly there in terms of the channeling of arms and, and military training and support to differently aligned uh, armed groups inside Libya, uh, particularly in the Nafusa Mountains, uh, and, and then running up to the assault on Tripoli. So those tensions were beginning to emerge um, uh, and very quickly came into the open. Well, what came to the open was very quickly Libyan uh, resentment of Qatar seeming to play um, too strong a, a role. Um, one certainly didn't see strong coordination between the UK and France on the ground afterwards. Uh, um, you know, they both had their interests in uh, um, in trade, uh, probably in weapons sales for the future. They were not necessarily strong partners, and the Europeans didn't really act very strongly together on the on the ground, um, uh, nor in liaison with the uh, with the US. So, indeed, um, there 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 wasn't really uh, strong international coordination. Yeah. And um, I mean, you also indicate that given um, how relatively uh, quickly and bloodlessly, um, not to say it was completely bloodless, the transitions in Tunisia and Egypt had transpired, that there was also an expectation that this would be a, almost a quick, clean kind of operation um, and over before you know it, so to speak. Yes, I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why I, I, I don't think you know, in the case of Iraq, there was a long period of the neocons, as they as they referred to, you know, planning and seeking the moment to bring about regime change in in Iraq. That wasn't at all the case in Libya. The the the, the Western countries, once they'd made their peace with uh, Gaddafi um, over nuclear uh, non you know, after giving up his nuclear weapons, and, and that was after the invasion of Iraq. Yes, exactly. But but then, you know, from then on, I mean, they were valuing Libya as a partner in counterterrorism efforts, um, you know, returning people to uh, to, to Libya. Um, uh, Tony Blair wanted a photo shoot in his tent when he went to Libya, Sarkozy. We shall see what the true story is of uh, election funding when the courts have finished considering that. I'm sorry, the, these are, um, this is a case now, um, the, the main allegation of which is that uh, Gaddafi uh, clandestinely um, funneled millions of dollars to uh, Sarkozy for his re-election campaign. And, and which uh, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi has, has spoken publicly about, of course, one can't, it's for the courts to judge the, 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 the truth of that. But the, the, the point is that sort of key Western leaders were 
perfectly happy with their relations with Gaddafi. Uh, it was the Libyan people, or a large section of them, who decided that they weren't, and that confronted the external actors with, you know, decisions as to what they were then going to going to do. So it wasn't contemplated in advance. And I think, as you you rightly imply, uh, and indeed as I say in the book, I think their initial assumption was that just because. Mubarak had gone relatively quickly, Ben Ali had gone relatively quickly, you know, the expectation was that Gaddafi would be gone relatively quickly. So, um, uh, so there was more an assumption of regime change than a plan for regime change at, at the beginning of the intervention, in my, my opinion. And, and perhaps also a lack of awareness that, in contrast to um, Egypt and Tunisia, Libya really didn't have any of, of the institutions that would have been uh, required to take uh, control of a stable transition. Absolutely, yes. No, that's that's uh, uh, and uh, both uh, both the state institutions and and an equivalent of the very strong civil society role that was played in Tunisia in particular. Mm -hmm. um, turning now to the regional dimensions of uh, of this intervention. Your book uh, suggests that the Arab League and the African Union took substantially different positions on the Libya intervention, but that it proceeded because the African Union, which um, had very serious reservations about what was happening, was ultimately marginalized by a combination of Libyan, regional, and international parties. If my, my reading of, of, of your book is um, correct, what, if any, lessons does this hold about the role of regional organizations in matters of conflict and conflict resolution? Well, uh, the African Union, uh, and indeed its sub-regional organizations, have a very considerable history in conflict resolution in, in Africa, or efforts in that, uh, that direction, uh, which one can't really say regarding the, the Arab League. I mean, mm -hmm. but, um, um, so, so the African Union came to this with a, a, a strong view that uh, uh, they had um, experience to bring, um, and that indeed they should take the lead role in African countries. Um, that wasn't a view that was shared at all by the leading intervening countries. Um, and I think it's also fair to say it wasn't a view that was shared by many Libyans because uh, um, the way Gaddafi had um, spent uh, Libya's resources on his African adventures and his relations with Africa um, had, if anything, alienated a lot of Libyans from uh, um, from seeing themselves uh, as uh, linked into to, to Africa. Um, so the African Union in that context was handicapped in the case of, of, of Libya and was never taken really seriously as an actor by the leading interveners from the very beginning, from the time that uh, they were prevented from their high level panel from even going to uh, Tripoli as they were planning to do just as the uh, the bombing of, of Tripoli began. Uh, and that left very, very considerable bitterness. I mean, Zuma, Jacob Zuma, although he was persuaded to uh, uh, that South Africa voted for the Security Council resolution, was very quickly critical and retrospectively was very bitter about what he called the marginalization of, uh, uh, of Africa. Um, that's had a, you know, a continuing effect. Um, uh, I think today uh, the United Nations um, is uh, recognizing the importance of its partnership with the African Union. Some people in the UN might almost say being too deferential to the African Union in, in some contexts. And, and right now, uh, Africa is pushing very strongly to uh, have the post of special representative of the Secretary General uh, in Libya and being supported in that by China, certainly, and, uh, and, and, and probably, probably Russia. Um, my own view, is, as I think I, I express in the book, um, is that what was required if there was to be a managed transition in, in Libya was for the different actors to, to work in some kind of coordination. And uh, mm -hmm. the, the only way you might have, or your best chance of getting a mediated outcome 
would have been if the Africans put the maximum pressure on Gaddafi, to whom they had access, and, and actually Zuma and the African Union were virtually the only ones who had face-to-face -face, um, mediation with Gaddafi, rather than lots of contacts with Saif and, and others uh, around uh, Gaddafi. Uh, and then it would have required those who had the influence because of their support with the, the National Transitional Council to urge them towards a mediated outcome rather than to assure them of military victory. But um, uh, that wasn't what uh, uh, what they were interested in. Um, I'd, I'd now like to turn to some of the broader issues uh, that were raised by the Libya intervention and, and many of which you also address in your book. Um, Libya was initially seen as the triumph of the doctrine of uh, response, or the principle rather, of responsibility to protect. Yet today it's seen very much as both its first and last hurrah. What are your reflections on responsibility to protect in light of what happened in Libya? And if I may just add, of course, um, Libya, many people would say, had a um, germane influence on how um, those who were involved in the intervention would later look at issues um, uh, like uh, Syria and, yeah. and elsewhere. Well, I, I differ with some people in that I don't think the doctrine of responsibility to protect was the key influence in the, Liber the Libya intervention. Mm -hmm. um, it, it takes us back to the conversation about Rwanda and, and Bosnia, because that's where the development of the doctrine of responsibility to protect came from. It was the, uh, um, you know, it, it developed out of, out of that. Um, but I think the same influence of the consequences of those non-interventions would have uh, influence the interveners in the same way, even if the doctrine of responsibility to protect hadn't been sort of uh, formulated along the along the way. So, although some of the language used in in uh, Security Council discussions resolutions uh, followed um, uh, responsibility to protect language, um, I don't I don't think the fact that the doctrine had been agreed by the General Assembly was critical in the in the decision. I think it was events, events that, that drove the, uh, uh, the the intervention. It's certainly true, though, uh, that the consequence of, of Libya is that um, those countries which abstained, um, in particular in the Security Council, Russia and China, um, India, you know, would certainly not again uh, allow an authorization of use of force uh, in the way they did in the case of, of Libya. And they've said that in, in terms. Um, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said it very early on. And even if you go back and look at the doubts they expressed in explaining their abstentions on the vote, it was that, um, you know, a resolution had been carried authorizing the use of force without saying who was going to implement it, what the rules of engagement would be, what the limitations, limits of the use of force were to be. Um, and that won't happen again. Um, uh, and indeed, we have certainly seen how that influenced the, the, the Syria debate. Although, again, I think one should, um, uh, you know, Syria is a, a hugely complicated uh, geopolitical yeah. <laughs> subject in itself. So I don't think we should pitch non-intervention in Syria solely on the consequences of the uh, uh, the criticisms of the Libya intervention. Yeah, point taken. But nevertheless, um, would you agree that for many of those who for, um, whose support would be vital, the concepts of humanitarian intervention and responsibility to protect were very substantially discredited by events in Libya. Yes, I mean, responsibility to protect was in part an, an effort to get out of a previous debate about humanitarian intervention that had become all about military intervention, but unfortunately, the responsibility to protect debate has become all about military intervention again, although the concept of responsi responsibility to protect was very clear in talking about responsibility to prevent, responsibility to rebuild after after intervention. Um, but yes, I, I, I think that um, 
authorization of the use of force for what are said to be humanitarian purposes is going to be extraordinarily difficult in future. Mm -hmm. um, turning now to the International Criminal Court, um, your book suggests that the indictment served by the ICC against a number of Libyan officials in 2011 in practice had the effect of causing both the Libyan government and opposition to harden their uh, positions and in so doing make a negotiated uh, resolution of this crisis um, more difficult. Are there broader lessons to be learned here about how and when um, the ICC pursues or should pursue its mandate in such situations? I think that's a tough issue and people have um, tried to analyze it in broader, you know, more, many more contexts than just uh, Libya. You know, I come from an Amnesty International background. I'm a strong supporter of the creation of the International Criminal Court. I think criminal accountability for war crimes and crimes against humanity is extremely important. Um, uh, in the case of Libya, um, I don't think the the indictment had an overwhelming impact on Gaddafi, actually, because I think his obduracy was already very clear. Although there's some indication that at the end it may have uh, it may have influenced things, uh, and indeed and those still, around them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, and, and on the other hand, it certainly. Um, made the National Transitional Council feel that they, their moral justification was, uh, was, was confirmed. I think there are certainly issues of, of timing and what I think the international community doesn't want to get into is a situation where some of those who were enthusiastic to refer the situation in Libya to the International Criminal Court are then trying to find Gaddafi, you know, and place of exile in a country that doesn't recognize its jurisdiction so that they could get him out of there uh, um, without the risk of prosecution by the International Criminal Court. And uh, uh, in the book, I quote some mocking comments of, of Saif uh, about uh, uh, how that makes a bit of a, a mockery, at least not of the court itself, but of those who, uh, um, who, who, who took those, um, those positions. I think there was some talk of him uh, taking up with uh, Mengistu Haile Mariam in uh, Zimbabwe. And, and perhaps... Yeah, I don't know the full truth of the efforts that were made. I mean, I, I, I do know that from the UK government, the uh, cabinet minister phoned Equatorial Guinea to see if they might uh, offer a, a, a place of exile because they were not a party to the uh, International Criminal Court. Um, many people would say that while the situation in Libya in 2011 may well have um, represented a compelling case for international action, they at the same time find it inconceivable that those leading the intervention had the interests of the Libyan people at heart or could have appropriately served those interests. And that the outcome we witnessed in Libya in subsequent years was therefore very much a foregone um, conclusion. I mean, you've You've mentioned your own views on, um, on the uh, illegal invasion and occupation uh, of Iraq. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, on this perspective uh, that, that a, a humanitarian intervention was entrusted to those who were incapable of, of fulfilling um, that mandate? I mean, we haven't mentioned the word oil in, in this discussion. And of course, uh, many people would argue that it wasn't an issue because as you note, Gaddafi had already very much made his peace with Blair, Berlusconi um, and others. But you know, as, as, as a general principle, knowing what we already knew then, for example, about, uh, about Iraq and the long-term US and European support for Ben Ali and, and Mubarak, how, how would you respond to this uh, question? I, I haven't come across any clear evidence that uh, the motives of the intervention itself uh, were economic um, in terms of oil or other contracts. I mean, there's no doubt that uh, as the transition got closer, that uh, uh, a lot of countries were interested in making sure that they had the kind of links to uh, 
um, you know, to, to improve their position from that point of view or restore their position by reviving contracts they already had with the, the Gaddafi regime. So that certainly became a, a factor. And there were some statements from the NTC that they would favor those who had supported them. Right. Um, but I don't believe that was the, the, the motive for, for intervention. And it, and it really goes back to what I was saying about the intervention being responsive more than more than anything anything right. else um and you know even as the uh the the objective became more and more clearly regime change i think that was still in a genuine belief that regime change was in the interests of uh, uh of the people of, of of libya um as you know a very large proportion of the population of libya believed it to to be um I think it much more. So I don't. I don't think the fact that there wasn't an effective follow through was because of the motives of those who intervened. I think to some extent, uh, their failure to really consider fully their responsibility in the uh, post transition period is is certainly to be be criticised. But I think the sort of the um, the sort of seeming inevitability uh, of uh, how hard a path Libya has had since then um, goes much more to uh, the long history of, of, of Libya. Um, and I, I'm no historian of Lib Libya, but I, but I sort of summarize it as, uh, you know, a country that, that never really had a period of effective institutional development. Um, three provinces of the Ottoman Empire, um, a period of brutal, indeed, genocidal Italian colonialism, a battleground in the Second World War with armies going to and fro, giving rise to a period of British and French military administration put together by the UN into what was really a rather weak monarchy that itself had achieved relatively little in institutional development before Gaddafi took over. And then 40 years of Gaddafi, who, who was um, explicitly opposed to developing the normal institutions of a modern diplomatic, uh, a modern democratic state. Um, so, I mean, the, the naivety was in believing uh, that it would then be you know, relatively easy. And, and I think that naive, naivety existed both on the side of the of the interveners who thought, you know, here's a country, it isn't a poor country, there's enough wealth to invest. We're meeting a lot of very well-trained um, uh, professionals, as indeed there were. Those professionals themselves had quite a high degree of self-confidence in their ability to uh, step up and, and and take Libya forward, um, and there wasn't a recognition of how crippled Libya was by the lack of institutional development. Uh, how, apart from uh, the central bank and the National Oil Corporation, there was very little to inherit in the way of sound institutions. Uh, the inheritors were a group of people who had never worked together, had no experience of working together. Uh, Gaddafi had, you know, divided to rule. Um, so I think that's where one has to look for the difficult trajectory um, that has followed. Not not to say that it's all inevitable, but it, but it, uh, um, but it was, I think, inevitably going to be extremely difficult. Uh, and I don't think that really has to do with the, the motives rather than perhaps the, uh, the ignorance and naivety of, uh, of some of the interveners. Um, a, a question of historical interest, um, given that you've uh, on, on several occasions in this discussion referred to the absence of an institutional infrastructure in Libya, as you know, Libya was, for all intents and purposes, um, a UN protectorate um, after the Second World War and until it achieved uh, independence in 1952. And I was curious, given that you were the um, inaugural um, leader of, of the UN mission in 2011, whether you were able to uh, consult the records or experience of that previous era of UN involvement in Libya? And if so, whether there was anything that you found uh, useful in that history? 
the, the UN involvement in Libya in that period was headed by a man called Adrian Pelt, um, mm. uh, who uh, published uh, an 888-page uh, book uh, that is an account of uh, uh, that, that period. Um, and it is extremely interesting, and I found it extremely interesting. Um, but I think there are very few analogies to be drawn between that period and, and 2011, 2012. Um, uh, and it's not quite true to call it UN trusteeship, because actually the, uh, the administration of Libya was in the hands of the British and French military administrations right up to the handover to the, um, um, the, the King Idris uh, government. Um, so um, Adrian Pelt was not in the position of the UN transitional administrators in East Timor and Kosovo. In, in he had later, in, so the UN had no days. direct role in, in administration. Well, it, it was it was a role of, of put no no I mean not not in administration and indeed it's yeah. it's again it's quite interesting by analogy with with recent history that um, that Pelt had a pretty hard time with both the British and the French who were not ring a bell. On the, on the commission that he headed um, and who very clearly had their own uh, had their own interests um, as did the others who were part of the, the, the commission in Egypt um, uh, um, but um, but that was a period when Libya had no resources except scrap metal left from the Second World War virtually and the, the rent from uh, US and British Air Force bases um, uh, so there was no sort of there were no riches to uh, to, to squabble over, um, and um, uh, obviously at a very different stage of, uh, uh, of the, the, the regional and international context. But I but I certainly recommend anyone to uh, delve into uh, Adrian Pelt's uh, book and. Um, uh, there's a there's on YouTube. There's a clip of Adrian Pelt in in Libya, which I find delightful, and um, which uh, I used to play to people in the UN to kind of uh, show them a little of the the history, and was once played for me when I was visiting one of the towns in the Lefusa Mountains, and uh, I found it um, quite embarrassing and quite inappropriate to be compared to Adrian Pelt. Um, but, but it is it is interesting because it did incline Libya in the early period at least to be, I think, more open to a UN role than most countries in the region would have Who been. Who had been mandates of the League of Nations. So. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, any final um, reflections, uh, Ian Martin? Um, you, you served in Libya at a critical period. Um, a decade ago, and we're now in, in 2022. Your your book is is very much an account of um, what happened at that time, because you considered it very important to um, to recount uh, what had happened and why it had happened and how it had happened. I'd, I'd be very interested in any concluding reflections you may have. The lessons from 2011, 2012 to to 2022 uh, are not not easy to draw at all um, uh, without a lot of further analysis of what has happened in between. One of the things I found most inspiring in 2011, 20, 2022, uh, 2012 was the kind of emerging civil society in in Libya. Um, and it obviously didn't have the sort of the, uh, the the period of evolution that Tunisian civil society or Egyptian civil society had, um, but it was uh, coming to play. Uh, it played a significant role during the uprising and and beyond. Um, it's having a very hard time uh, today, um, but it's still of enormous importance for for Libya. Um, and deserves uh, support and, and, and attention. Conversely, the role of external actors, I'm afraid, has become less and less constructive. Um, uh, and the degree of external intervention um, has uh, uh, made Libya very much at, at mercy for a time of the, of the external actors. Um, we shall see whether they can uh, begin to pull more together to 
lead a, a constructive path forward, but that's certainly not been the not been the recent history. Um, so uh, uh, it's it's ironic in a way that Libya itself in 2012 was, you know, very reluctant. I mean, despite um, the welcome to some of the external support during the uprising, it was resistant to too strong a, a role from external actors in the immediate uh, aftermath. And um, that's one of the reasons why people who said there should have been a big uh, United Nations peacekeeping mission or stabilization mission that was never a, a possibility that would have been remotely acceptable to, to, to Libyans. And, and yet Libyans have reached a, a position where they are even more um, in the hands, it seems, of, um, of external actors. Um, so uh, uh, I hope that uh, those Libyans who still carry some of the original spirit of the uprising can, uh, can carry that forward and, and are able to determine their own future rather than have it uh, determined for them by the, the motives of external actors. Um, on, on that optimistic or at least hopeful note, uh, Ian Martin, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing your um, insights and expertise with uh, Connections. Once again, um, Ian Martin is the author of um, All Necessary Measures, question mark, a fascinating book about uh, the Libya intervention in 2011-2012, uh, published uh, last month by Hearst uh, Publishers. Join us also next week, we'll be speaking with Nabih Boulos, uh, Middle East editor of the Los Angeles Times, on his experiences covering uh, the war in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you.